Hello, 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 and welcome to this edition of the Jolly Heretic on Tour. I have a very special guest for you today, and that is Mr. Simon Evans, who is known as the right-wing comedian. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Simon, hello, how do you do? Very well, thank you, Edwin. Thank you for the definite article there. Uh, yes, I felt that that was yes, yeah. the only one. No, that that's right. There's, the... there's about three of us constantly toughing it out for, for the pinnacle. For the crown, for the <laughs> prize of being the most anti-work right-wing comedian chap. So that's what, that's what we have here. But he's not just a comedian. That as I as I discovered in the in the cafe earlier when I met him, um, it was it, there's 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 more there's more depth there's depth to his thought. There's, 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 it's, you know, this is not this is not just 1970s Irish jokes. This is this is so we're gonna we're gonna look into that now. One of the things that you have done that you've done part of your routine um, mm. is the narrowness of your eyes. Yes. Which I have no idea where that comes from. I mean, I, I know your keen interest in uh, heritability and so on. Um, I sometimes wondered whether it was uh, a symptom of my sort of evasive, secretive nature. But I do remember, I do remember consciously registering that Clint Eastwood in the Spaghetti Westerns had a particularly impressive squint. That this was a way you could look at people without giving too much away about any kind of insecurity you might have yourself. I might have, I might have enhanced it from an early age. I, might, I think I might have been practicing a kind of certain amount of, yeah. you know, the cheroot smoke, you know, you narrow your eyes against that. But the truth is, I have no option. I can open them as wide as I like, and there's just no, there's well, just no aperture. Normally, when you meet, when you, I was in the cafe earlier, when you, and you, and you I saw you, you were coming out of the loo wearing a, wearing a Stetson and uh, earphones. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> and and, uh, and I, d I wasn't sure it was you at first, because it, normally when you meet someone famous, it's, oh, well, they're, they're, they're shorter in real life. But in your case, your eyes were bigger. Oh, that's nice. Well, it is enhanced by stage lighting. I mean, if I carry an under mirror. <laughs> I did genuinely early on consider the possibility of having a... a when I first started as a stand-up, I thought it was a disadvantage before I made it a brand. That you couldn't see my eyes because they say that, you know, the eyes are the window of the soul. And, and that, of course, is uh, important when you're doing stand-up. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to register. Only by looking at somebody's eyes can you really understand how ironic they're being in what in what in what tone in what in what mood to to understand their um these words if you are a traditional like a an entertainer you know the john osborne's entertainer uh, type uh, era you know the the eyes would be you would wear makeup you'd wear a, quite a lot of mascara eyeliner and possibly enhance the eyebrows as well just so that that can become in extremely expressive mm. and I don't think it's coincidental you know you often see evidence on the tube of mental illness where people have scratched the eyes out of posters and so on or put chewing gum onto the pupils of, of uh, famous actresses and so on how are they being stared at yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. but you know, you, with, with, with Simon the, eye, the eyes are the arrow slip to the soul that's right um, of, a, of, a, of a castle <laughs> that, is, that, that, that has had to cope with the uh, and Mott and Bailey Mott slings and arrows a uh, wooden castle Okay, a sl <laughs> slings and arrows of, uh, of outrageous fortune, um, and one of those uh, talk about fortune and whether whether we uh, whether it's nature or nurture or whatever. So one mm. of those which uh, you've uh, talked about is an interesting uh, interesting little aspect to how you came into came into being. Yes, absolutely. 1964, I was conceived in a fertility clinic in central London in Wimpole Street, specifically. Um, run by a woman called Mary Barton. Um, anyone who is watching and is interested, she has a Wikipedia page. You can get all the details there. And my parents visited that, having failed to conceive by the traditional means over about eight years of marriage. And, um, and my mother got pregnant using a, a sperm donation. And they were told at the time to be absolutely secretive about it. It was impressed upon them that there was a, a serious stigma attached, that there was it potentially... It was like adultery, wasn't it? Well, it was debated heavily in the House of Lords along those lines, yes. The Lords spiritual certainly felt it was, I think. And um, certainly a, a legal grey area. But... Um, also, I think it was just thought to be psychologically damaging, possibly for the child, if they knew that they were being that that would have been their origin, which is understandable. I mean, it is slightly unsettling to think of a a, a procedure like that as um, as uh, the uh, the gate where, you, you, where you, through you, one you, you, <laughs> you, you, you were the origin of a, a paid wank. Yeah, yeah, essentially. But then, um, yeah, so fifty-two years passed, or something like that. Nineteen. Uh, 2018, I discovered. So and they, they just didn't tell you? you, you Absolutely silent. And they would have taken it to their graves, you know. Um, your father had died, were you? 
My father is still alive. Oh. He'll be 94 at the end of this month, God willing. And um, I'd always felt growing up that he was he was a kind man to me, but he was uh, he there was a sort of psychological gap, but it didn't seem to me you know monstrous. It just seemed slightly. Um, I felt that sort of, I don't quite share his interest in um, avionics and, and gardening. You know, I'm more bookish. That's perfectly normal. But, but you look nothing like him at all. But I don't look like him, and that even that would have been fine. But it, he looks a great deal like his half sister, very much like his father, and a great deal like his father's brothers and sisters. And that was quite a wide range of the Evanses. Um, there were nine brothers and three sisters, I think, uh, me and my grandfather's generation, and they all had a look. Um, and my dad has it too, and I just don't have it. But I looked enough like my mother's father for that to sort of die down as a suspicion. And anyway, I knew that their marriage was... It was unthinkable that my mother would have had an affair or that there would have been any other, you know, um, scenario I could imagine that would, have, that would mean I wasn't his son. So I just sort of pushed it down. Uh, I got the DNA test done, out much more out of sort of intellectual curiosity, really. I'd been reading a little bit about DNA. I'd done a show for the Edinburgh Fringe called Genius, which was uh, a sort of light-hearted investigation into what, what, what causes genius to arise you know, and, and why our present-day culture does not seem to be comfortable with it. Mm. Oh, um, like I like me and Bruce did in the Genius Fallon, yes. Right, did you? <laughs> yeah, the Genius Fallon. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and so anyway, you know, DNA came up a lot in the in the books I read and so on, and you just be sort of become a little bit curious. But um, so you know, fifty quid, life changing discovery. And so, um, so you got the result back, mm. and uh, what actually I got was um, my results were heading into my junk folder. I hadn't registered that they they had been determined. I got an email from a half sister in um, Australia, and she said, um, "You've cropped up in my inbox as a close genetic match. This might be puzzling to you, or perhaps you're thinking, aha, I knew it. Whatever. If you'd like to discuss it, give me a call." So she knew. She knew. She'd been. She'd known for over ten years, and it turned out there were dozens already of of people because we had all been sired uh, by the same father, the same. Donor who was the husband of the woman who was running the clinic. Yeah, you used that word sire. When mm. I, we, we, we bought a pedigree dog in 1989, and to prove its pedigree, you got a family tree of uh, going back to its great grandparents. It was a pedigree Springer Spaniel, and the title accorded to a male dog is not Mister, it is sire. Sire. Yes. I think they do. They use that in horses as well. I and and dam, I think, is, dam is the, the female. The yeah, that's right. Yeah. So yes, I mean it's a we, you know we still all struggle with the terminology. Generally speaking, his name is Bertolt Wiesner. He's an Austrian Jew who left Austria in the 1920s, long before uh, Nazi menace. Or How did you discover the name? It was a DNA detective or something? Well, it's I mean, it's quite a long and involved story. But there was a chap called Barry Stevens who had known he was conceived in the same clinic, and all he really wanted to know this was in the early 2000s was whether or not his his sister was his full sister they'd had the same mother, but had they used the same sperm donor? And so he was on a hunt for that, but he is a, document, a professional documentary filmmaker anyway. So he came back to London and started um, trying to dig into it. The records had all been destroyed, but he managed to find the son, Jonathan Wiesner, of the uh, couple who ran the clinic. And Jonathan was very helpful, cooperative, and offered to have his own DNA checked and, and um, uh, compared to Barry's. And that... that pretty much demonstrated that they were they were half brothers and and gradually since then extrapolating from the data that we have of the various it seems there was only one other donor his name was Richter and um, just sort of broadly speaking you know using a bit of basic statistical analysis to uh, to try and determine how many uh, Wiesners there are probably are. We know of about 60 or 70, but it's thought that there is probably somewhere between 600 and 1,000 um, who, were, who were conceived over that 23 years, um, many of whom will, of course, already be dead or will never have a DNA test. But others of them, their children are now, so nephews and nieces from our point of view are coming through, and it's still expanding. Not quite as quickly, perhaps, as we had thought, so perhaps there's been a miscalculation, I don't know. Heavens. Uh, how, uh, so, um, so when was this that you discovered this? I got that first email on 
Halloween 2018. 2000, 31st of October. 2018. So, so you were f 53? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so so you, you, you've, you've lived, a, well, is the word a lie? I mean, like, like a failure to volunteer information. Yes, I mean, I, I, I mean, you could say lie, or certainly a um, yes, well, a secret. But um, I, I think I made a fairly conscious choice to be very sympathetic to that decision. I don't think it has caused me any pain or discomfort or confusion. That I, I mean, we all live with a degree of confusion about why we are who we are and so on, but. Um, I think on the whole they made the right choice, and they were acting on scientific advice. You know, how did they? How did they react when you confronted them with your knowledge? I told my mother. I, I managed to get her apart from my father because I wasn't entirely sure whether my father would even know, of course. And um, and I told her that I'd had a DNA test and that it had um, thrown up that I was half Jewish. I didn't say that I'm a Vizna and I, there are dozens of us and all the rest of it. And just sort of left a space for her. And um, it was rather sweet. She visibly sort of, she took a deep breath. And it was obviously something she had wondered whether it would come up at some point. And she had a sort of, not exactly a speech prepared, but she, she ha had a story that, she, you know, she didn't have to dig that hard for it, considering how long ago it was. And she emphasised how much I'd been wanted and how desperate they'd been to have a child and how how sweet my father had been that when he discovered he was infertile, he had offered my mother a divorce because he knew how desperate she was to have children and that he had, you know, she was absolutely determined that they would they would sort something out between them and um, and how pleased they'd been with the, the service they'd had, you know, so it was all rather lovely. But my father is, understandably, you know, he, he maintains that um, nature and nurture for him it's his father you know it was it was a nurture thing that he was the father in, in a meaningful sense he never felt like he was raising another man's son or anything of that kind it, for him it was a thing they did together mm -hmm. and um and that of course was sweet and touching and and also totally understandable understandable but, but i have to say i don't fully accept it so i believe i have inherited significant traits from Vizna. I suspect you have. I mean, it's, it's all, and, and particularly those tend to manifest as you get older. So there's yeah. something that is the Wilson effect. I'm sure you're familiar with it, whereby the, the, your parents are creating your childhood environment, mm. and that has an influence on your intelligence and to some extent your personality. But once you once you move out and you start creating an environment that is consistent with your own innate traits, then the genetics come out, right. and the heritage belief intelligence, for example, rises from point two to point eight. Uh, and, and things like this. It's the, the, the Wilson effect. So one would expect you to become more like Visna uh, as you age. Yes. Um, uh, and, uh, and so I mean, we were talking earlier in the cafe about, about this, the, the, way, the way that uh, the, the, the whole notion of, of genetics playing a part in the kind of people that you're attracted to, that you're interested in, and mm. the opposites attracting and that kind of thing. Uh, you were saying some very interesting points about that. Well, I, I remember reading Schopenhauer on it. I haven't read him from cover to cover, but he, he, um, he survives in his uh, epigrams and so on <coughs> pretty well. And he says that, um, that, you know, there is this thing he refers to as the will, which is almost as a, 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 an invisible f a force that's invisible to us that operates beneath our, our radar, but that drives our behaviour, our intentions, and that's what seeks out a mate. And it selects that mate on the basis that the the uh, the progeny is likely to benefit from the the, the mixture. The, uh, the you you select somebody whose whose qualities will fill in your gaps and and uh, compensate for your flaws and so on. But that makes them difficult company for you. You, you know you that you will pick somebody whose temperament is is not necessarily the opposite of yours, but is. Um, most likely to mitigate yours in combination. That, now, of course, it doesn't always work by any means, but there, there's, I think everyone senses that there's an element of truth to that. He has a wonderful line. I mean, he's, he was, would have been a tremendously good stand-up, Schopenhauer. He says, at the moment of copulation, the devil's laughter is heard because you know, the devil has tricked you into committing yourself to raising children, which is, which is going to be extraordinarily tiresome, demanding, and, and, and compromise your, your, your freedom. 
um, and you've been tricked into doing it with somebody who you thought you were in love with, but in fact it was the will that was that was selecting them, um, rather than your conscious desire for uh, smooth flowing conversation and creative uh, fruitful uh, ideas. Uh, and, 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 some, and someone who you have a great deal in common with. No, not yeah. necessarily. No, no. no. It, it, I mean, I think to them level in common with perhaps. Yes, but not more than that. Well, I mean, there are all sorts of. Uh, systems that have evolved over in different societies and civilizations that, that, that probably maybe consciously perhaps just you know, through trial and error mitigate that, that problem. And um, I think most of us recognize that arranged marriage is not quite the catastrophe necessarily that you know it, we, we sometimes discuss, that it can work out quite nicely. I think there's something to be said for it in some regards. And I was reading Will Durant recently. I don't know if you know him, American historian. He wrote the, the story of civilization, great sort of 12 volume thing. And he discusses early civilization, such as Indian civilization, where you had an arranged marriage and it was set up quickly because there was no way to prevent children starting to have sex if they, once they were through puberty, but they weren't um, emotionally mature to cope with it. And there's, it's a it's a way of understanding some of the traditions that seem barbaric, possibly in a way that actually go well. That's that's reasonable what you're trying to do there, but certainly children anywhere between under the age of twenty five, very few people are able to understand what qualities they might be looking for in a not even a lifetime mate, even just somebody no, that is, they can cope with good, children. Yeah, this with, is a very you know. good point. Yeah, they will be they will be, they will be motivated by. Um, Perhaps people that are too sim uh, are very si the, who would you create a very strong bond with a person yeah. that's very similar to you yeah. similar to you genetically similar to you in personality terms so if you meet someone like that uh, then that's who you'll be attracted to but that will ne won't necessarily work as a partner because it'll be you'll be too similar you won't balance each other out absolutely I mean we were talking no one will get the bills paid one of the one of the classic very obvious and fair possibly been quite a shallow one but you know some people tend to be night owls and others like to be early risers and if you find somebody who is two night owls who will stay up all night drinking they will find that they are made for each other they, that's a, a match made in heaven but a nightmare for a child Mm. You know, if those two people raising children, the children will hear the, the, the voices raised in shrieks of laughter at 2 a.m. When they're, when they're trying to get some sleep before the night before school, and it'll be very difficult for them. On the other hand, two early risers possibly might work better for the children, but if the child is up late at night themselves and the, and the parents are getting increasingly grouchy because this child won't go to bed, mm. Mm. <laughs> then, then there's another problem. Whereas... Sadly, you know, if you've got a night owl and an early riser, the marriage might not provide the, the company that they want, but you create a, a, a house that basically operates on two overlapping shifts. Well. And if you think yeah. that I mean, this whole idea of marrying for romantic love is mm. really quite new. Yeah. If you, if you look at someone like, I don't know if you've read Denis de Rougemont, Love in the Western World, and uh, we, we, until really quite recently, I mean, possibly 100 years ago, you didn't meet someone in a bar. No. It didn't work. We couldn't do that. Women were chaperoned. You would, friends and family would arrange meetings and then you would sort of see how you got on. Well, even, I mean, Jane Austen, those are rom-coms essentially, but there's not a great deal of rom really involved, is there? It's, it's all quite knowingly transactional. You know, the, the house is presented as being every bit as handsome as the, as the jawline and cheekbones of Mr. Darcy. There's no, there's no suggestion that this is, if she is you know, fighting against convention, it, it has to be, for the rom-com to work, he has to come with the house. But the implication then is that, inherent, and this is in Denis de Rougemont as well, that the true, the romantic love, you know, the love of the troubadours, mm. the, is this Gnostic heresy almost, mm. again, a, 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 a true love would be the idea of uh, the, where you find a person that is basically your, what Plato called your, on, you know, your spiritual double, mm. that you've been divided in half by Zeus before time, the Platonic hermaphrodite. The amulet's been split. Right, yeah. and, th and that that kind of person will take you to, you know, heaven, mm. uh, but also to, almost like to hell, mm. because you're too similar. Well, this is, uh, not that I'm an expert on it, and um, I shouldn't flash too many of these terms around, <laughs> unearned valor, but that's Tristan und Isolde, right? The, well, yeah, uh, for, you yeah, get, of course. So they, they only unite in death. 
the, the, they're in torment, the unresolved chord throughout the whole of that opera is because they are, that is, they are supposed to be soulmates, but they cannot be together in, in, in life. It's an impossibility, partly because he's contractually obliged to deliver it to his boss, but also because it's, it just cannot be, you know, it, 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 that, 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 that is not for man to have in this life. And that is, that is uh, they, w they probably wouldn't work as a marriage anyway. The, 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 the heightened love is partly because it cannot be. Mm. It, that's what makes it so, so Absolutely. excruciating. Yeah, yeah. And that's what you do get. There's a, there's a poem by A. E. Houseman, the, the nettle waves above the something or other, uh, da -da 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 above the graves of lovers who killed mm. themselves for love. Yeah. Um, and people are still making this observation, as if it was fresh, but that's how we go, you, know, you know, that there is, there is nothing that tastes so sweet in the in the mouth as it does in the eyes. You know, oh, you shouldn't be your eyes, I mean, you should yeah. <laughs> How would you know? <laughs> but anyway, so there is that element. And I do think the other thing about an arranged marriage, of course, is that you start, which is ideal, you start with a common enemy, which is to say, you, you know, your in-laws who have thrown you together in, in despite of your um, your preferences or your, your stated determination just to remain single. And that's a little bit like the way a sergeant major, you know, you join the army, there's an absolutely brutal tyrant, a, uh, a draconian uh, headmaster type figure who, who creates an esprit de corps partly because they all hate him. You know, and that there is nothing quite like having a common enemy for for is that, is that a, is that Do you think that's a, something that's sort of naturally evolved or is it a, de a deliberate conscious choice? Probably naturally evolved. Mm. But yes, I think almost all things are thrown together. They arise through trial and error. Sometimes conscious trial and error. Somebody's trying to find out what works and sometimes they just notice it works, you know, like uh, some meat falls into the fire and you go, oh my God, that tastes better. But... Um, you know, Matt Ridley's book, uh, How Innovation Works, mm. this is about technology rather than marriage, I think. I can't remember if he, he might talk about social systems. Well, really fascinating book that demonstrated, I think, pretty unanswerably that, that almost everything, almost every innovation of, of worth and value arises through trial and error, uh, essentially, and, and people sort of having some idea of what might work, but experimenting with it. And then afterwards, the scientists come along and explain why it works. Mm -hmm. Like Cossacks riding down to bayonet the wounded, essentially. You know, there's, there's, <laughs> there's you know, they, 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 had, they, did not, they did not win that battle. Now, that now they are picking the pockets of the dead. But that's, uh, that's also a helpful contribution, of course, the science behind um, Watt's steam engine. But, but it was the 500 different types of seal that didn't work. That were the, the that were the barrier, not not the failure to recognise that P equals V over A or whatever it is. Yeah, and one of the um, I did. Uh, we're talking about genius, and uh, I did a, a book, uh, oh God, about ten years ago now, called The Genius Famine, with a, a guy, a reader in psychiatry called uh, Bruce Charlton. Um, we had we hit upon this idea of the endogamous personality. So the idea that, that these geniuses, they have outlier high intelligence, they have be which means that fine, they can come up with ideas. They have, they have subclinical psychopathic traits, which means they don't care about offending people or they're too mm. autistic to realise they're offending people. They have low conscientiousness, they can think outside the box, you know. Um, but, um, but they, and this allows them to come up with their ideas. But they also have this almost, almost, almost a sort of semi-spiritual mission. They have like a sense of something beyond themselves, almost like they're not free, that they, that they must do this, a mission that they must fulfill, almost mm -hmm. like they don't have free will. Um, and it's an interesting, they've been, some of them have talked about this, and it's an, it's an interesting notion, free will, um, to all that we... Uh, uh, to, to all that we discuss, I mean, you know, you've, you, you uh, sperm donor conceived, and you will find, it, were you to ever meet uh, a, a half sister, mm. uh, you might find, or uh, you, you were very attracted to her because mm. there's been no Westermark effect that hasn't happened. Uh, we don't no, know if it's happened to anyone in the family, but so far of all the people that we've met, I had met a couple of brothers before, funnily enough, mm -hmm. um, and worked with them. They were you in the Westmore field. No, I didn't know that they were. No, one of them was a sort of a hero of mine in a way, a, a writer, a comedy writer that I very much admired who's about 15 years older than me. And um, Well, that's 
a huge thing in com comedy. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'd, I mean, I'd almost go so far as to say that I'd nicked a couple of his ideas and reworked them a little bit for um, for my stand up, you know. So, uh, the, the, you know, the, we'd the, overlapped. The, 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 sh the shark watch. The yes, exactly. That was that yeah. For him. yeah. <laughs> well, it's sort of what? It was sort of was. In Work of the Devil, uh, which was the show I did about this, I did go back to that. That was the, 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 the diving watch thing, was a bit that I did. And. I don't think I nicked it from him. I'm trying to remember what the order of events was, but he wrote a book called Big Babies about how infantilised we all were. And he talked about, his name is Michael Bywater, and he talked about buying himself a, a, a an aviator's watch, a pilot's watch. I think the Breitling one is like two and three and a half grand or something because he wanted to look, you know, like rugged and, and competent like a pilot, despite the fact that he actually is a pilot. <laughs> And, and, and so he was dressing up as a pilot, even though he is a pilot. And he knows perfectly well that the Breitling chronometer is, uh, you know, a ruse. It's a, it's a nonsense. If you're a pilot, you can, you can safely re rely on Casio watches for about 150 quid with, with all the bells and whistles that you could conceivably need. So we had been operating in the same, you know, the ridiculous male jewellery of the, of the overly functional watch. All right. <laughs> See, we had had that accepted. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Free will in terms of... Um, it's a bit like that thinking fast and slow thing, isn't it? There are two modes. I think most of us recognise that we're not exercising free will in any meaningful sense 99% of the time. But I suppose there comes a point where you have to screw up your courage and make a decision that is perhaps counter to your best material interest because it's morally right or something. And, and that's the point at which free will becomes a meaningful conversation, I suppose, rather mm. than um, thinking, I don't know, do I fancy that woman? Yeah, but even, even, even then, you, you can't divorce. The, the, there was a John Hick, philosopher of religion, mm. and uh, he seems, essentially his argument is there is such a thing as free will. In the moment of decision-making, mm. uh, uh, he seems to take the view that there's almost like a vortex uh, and and then you make the decision. Now, it seems to me that that can only be the case if there is a soul, if there is a sort of non-spiritual thing that is independent of environment and genetics, yeah. um, and that it, some, I don't know how it can do it, it's tempted the devil, it's tempted to God, I don't know what he, what he means, um, but, th but this renders us free. But it seems to me otherwise, uh, it's just evolutionarily adaptive to believe that we have free will, isn't it? How do we go? I mean, I think that's a very, that's a very solid position. Yeah, uh, and and not just independently and individually, but societies function well when they are comprised of individuals who believe themselves to have free will. Um, judicial systems, in particular, are predicated on the idea that somebody made an, a free choice. You know, as soon as you can demonstrate that there was exceptional evidence to to, um, to oppose that view that presumption you it's, it's pretty much a mitigating factor isn't it? it you can get off altogether if you are considered to have been re, you know operating with reduced well i think it has to be the operating with reduced free will such that you don't realize it's wrong yeah. So there have been cases of this where so the, you, you, you can oh, say... Well, no, so the, I mean, I don't know where the British law stands, but certainly internationally at various times, the crime of passion has been... It, it will mitigate the, the, the sentence, certainly. In, Fra in France, yeah. yeah, yeah. Passion, they, they, yeah. The, you, you go in and you find your, your wife in, in bed with another man. Exactly. You, you, you lose your mind. Yeah. You lose your yeah. mind. You, yes. Yeah. So those, uh, that's very in favour of the males. I'm surprised, <laughs> I'm surprised, I'm surprised <laughs> they've kept that. You, you kill your wife because she's having an affair. And I'm, I'm surprised, I have to say, that that isn't uh, argued strongly. The one we discussed on GB News last night was the um, recent overturning of the of the defence presented by sort of just oil uh, protesters and so on for destroying works of art that they believed that the person who created that art would support their 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 um, their mission, and so that was an actual defence, even though it's criminal damage. It was criminal damage to a work of art that, that, that the artist would surely have been an environmental protester. And what they kind had, of somebody had actually used that? that. I know, but it had been accepted at some point just because of a motivated judge, I think. If I've understood it correctly, that seemed to be the. Uh, as, long as, they, as, long as, they were as long as they could persuade the judge that they genuinely believed that to be the case, that they were therefore. I mean, it's sort of Joan of Arc defence almost or something, isn't it? Extraordinary. 
but then you could believe it to be the, the case because you force yourself to believe. And that's what yes. I mean about free will. Yes. I mean, there is, a, there, is a, there is a notion of effortful control. Um, like what Kevin MacDonald came up with this. Um, which, is, which is the idea that you can force yourself, you really can, to believe things. Mm. Um, now, and when, when, those delusion, when those comforting delusions are pricked by aspects of reality, then you can react very, very strongly mm. because y it's almost like you feel that if th that will confront you with such dark feelings that everything will unravel and you will just lose control and God knows, you could kill yourself, I don't know. That mm. borderline personality or narcissism that people create a, a false sense of self, oh, I'm perfect, I'm the best, I'm brilliant, um, to just compensate for negative feelings. And then if, yeah. if, if something pricks that, then they can react in, with incredible aggression. We had, I mean, cognitive dissonance is mm. this term, and I think it's pretty much entered the lexicon now, isn't it? I yeah. remember hearing it, I remember very specifically the time and place when I first heard it and thought, that is interesting. And um, I think it is increasingly prevalent with the increasingly polarised politics that we have because to cross the chasm now seems almost impossible. I was talking to somebody about uh, Trump-Biden recently, not an American, but somebody who is firmly anti-Trump, regards Trump as a threat to democracy and you know the, 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 the survival of the country itself. And... Um, I just raised a couple of issues that I feel it's... I cannot quite see, for instance, how Trump could be a Russian asset essentially installed in the White House by Vladimir Putin and then for the next four years Putin does nothing to take advantage of the fact that his man is in the White House and then as soon as he's out again and Biden is elected, Putin thinks, right, now is the time to invade Ukraine. And they said, well... Perhaps it's not so much that he, you know, that he knew that he would let him get away with whatever he wanted, but it's just that Trump is unreliable, he's unpredictable. And so he was a little bit afraid of, of what he might do just because he's so crazy. And so I would say, well, that's certainly plausible. So why would Putin have deliberately installed a man in the White House who once in there became unpredictable and crazy and, and wouldn't allow him to pursue his own foreign policy objectives because he was afraid of Trump pulling the nuclear trigger. And I could almost hear the sort of grinding and the sparks, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Uh, in, in, and, and the point is, in a normal, more normal political situation, and I'm not a political expert, I'm sure I hold other views like this, that if, if, if subject to you know, scrutiny would, would also produce grinding noises, there's too big a chasm to cross for him to sort of say, oh, perhaps on this occasion I'm wrong. I'm wrong, or Trump isn't quite the Antichrist. In the same whereas if you had Heath and Wilson in the early 70s and somebody was saying, well, I think Heath's view on the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the common market is probably, you know what I mean? It's not, these are not huge. Existential questions. Exactly, you know, so it's quite easy to go, well, him for this, but him for that. But, but that is just not possible now. No, the, the Nobody in, in American politics can say, well, I, th I think Trump is correct on immigration, but Biden has a, uh, you know, a better grasp of, of modern monetary theory. So I mean, that's just not, it's not available, you know. So, so we've, we've polarised to such a degree. Yeah. And I've, I've interviewed a, a number of uh, comedians. On, I find it fascinating that it's, that it's, it's, it's predictable. You know, I research it in terms of, broader civilizational trends and things that happen in the winter of civilizational things that happen during a certain strauss how hormonal cycle or there's various other models of what's going on um, but i find it amazing that it, it's at every level i mean it's it, it's it's a, it's within poetry within mm. art and of course within comedy mm. uh, and it, and it's now getting getting to this point i mean you haven't been on a mainstream program or whatever for quite a while. 2011, I think, did you say you were last on Question Time or something like that? Or? I, I, no, I've done Question Time a couple of times since Brexit. Um, did once under Dibble B and once under Fiona Bruce, and I enjoy them very much, and if they're watching, I'll come back. There was something you haven't done since 2011. I haven't done Live at the Apollo or um, McIntyre's Roadshow, one of the big TV sort of uh, stand-up formats, which, to be fair, are kind of on their way out a little bit now. And I did do Live at the Apollo twice, which is a which perfectly decent haul. I haven't done Mock the Week, that's just gone now since 2011. I haven't done any TV panel game at all on BBC. I'm not necessarily, to emphasise, I'm not necessarily saying I deserve to, they've kept me out, it's a conspiracy. 
but, but I do notice that when challenged on the political bias on those shows, they say, well, there they're just aren't enough, you know, uh, right wing or right of centre comedians. There just aren't any available. I've never done Have I Got News For You. Never been asked to do that. Um, I'm not sure that I would do it now. Possibly I would, or I don't know. But um, but I would have been available for many years. And, and it's fine, it's their decision not to have me on, but it just always stuck in my craw a little bit. When they there said are two reasons why there aren't that many right-wing comedians. Okay, one, fine, uh, it, people th uh, that are motivated by their career and whatever will force themselves to believe the, do the dominant set of ideologies and competitively signal them and therefore at least overtly be left-wing, yeah. at least overtly. Um, but secondly, um, they are prevent there are routes to getting into comedy... Yes. You know, winning things, being on certain kinds of show, whatever. And if they start turn around and say, "Okay, well, we have to have an ethnic minority, and we have to have a woman," and we have, then those right wing comedians are not able to take those routes. No, it's interesting now that uh, because obviously the you know the podcast ecosystem and uh, independent media and so on, there are some more right wing or dissident comedians um, who are emerging, and and they are being kept even out of the comedy clubs. You know. And um, and being kept out of the uh, out of the smaller theatres in which they might tour, I I generally I'm I'm fine and um, and anyway my shows aren't particularly political anyway but the um, you know my live tour shows mm. but um, I think it's quite difficult yeah for somebody to start out now and even express say pro Brexit feeling which is literally clearly by by a, a you know. <laughs> The, the the majority view in the what country. What was that term was? they use? They use about that Clapton. What was the term? Um, Clapton. Was that the word? Yes, Clapton. Where pit where an audience clap rather than because they approve the sentiment rather than laugh compulsively because they've been amused. Mm -hmm. Is that what is that what you yeah, mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Clapton. Yeah. Well, I think it was in an interview with you. It was an interesting term. You you said that um, really good comedy manifests when people are laughing despite the fact that they're uncomfortable laughing about it. Well, it's short circuits. It, it gets to... They, they laugh before they've managed to intervene consciously. So <laughs> oh, like that, you know? That's the sound you, you want to hear. And, and I remember hearing it from my father in his armchair, you know, watching sitcoms in, in the 70s. But, you know, it, it, it always recognised when, when it was really... He had two laughs that I remember I would always liked and thought that were... Were, were worthwhile and would would please the the writer to see. Mm -hmm. One where he was almost winded by the um, the, the sudden the punchline the twist, <laughs> like that. Mm. And the other one was because uh, he can see what's coming, you know. So you see normal wisdom coming up the up up the the main path, and then and then you cut to the. You know the fellow in the hard hat who's about to uh, fire up the boiler again after fixing it or whatever. You go, oh, I see what's going to happen here. Those those are all kind of enjoyable aspects to to comedy that aren't necessarily just about. There's a laugh I've heard for a number of people where they can't control, they lose control. Like, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Like, it was like a, like an orangutan. The uh, Jimmy Carr <laughs> the Jimmy is famously Carr kind of cursed he... with that, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> yeah, but I think he f that's his fake laugh. I think it he, might be. I don't know. He's so controlled, Jimmy. I haven't seen him in person for a long time. He's so controlled. He's so he's so calculating. I don't. I wouldn't put it past him, but equally, it might be genuine. I don't know. Oh, well, I, I met him at a conference and I chatted him for about twenty minutes. Um, he, he seemed. Uh, he did that that sort of. Um, he addressed his mate, which I don't think people that have. From wealthy backgrounds, have been to Cambridge. Should do. Like, I went to a posh university. <laughs> where I don't call them mate. Like, uh, I, I think I, I think that's pretentious. But I, I, it was like, I liked him. I thought he was a likable a likable guy. He, he, he then did throw in a, a particular joke that uh, I don't know why he had to do that. Which which uh, which he'd done. I'd seen him perform that same joke, and he, and he, and he jumped right. into conversation, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. But no, you're not a fan then of. Uh, uh, oh, not not a fan, but not in a. Um, in a hostile way. I mean, he's he's masterminded an extremely successful career, and it is a business after all. I I find that particular kind of humour that seems to be determined to th almost holding your nose to the to the vomit of of mankind, isn't it? I, I find it a little bit relentlessly grim, if I'm honest. I prefer laughter that's a, a comedy that's a bit more joyful. But having said that. I, I, you know, I like Frankie Boyle's joke writing, his grimness, which has 
that strikes me almost sort of adjacent to Gormenghast or something, though, Frankie Boyle stuff. There's a sort of gothic element to it that's... You know, what, what, do you, what do you think of Stuart Lee? He's widely considered one of the most successful intellectual comedians. Of our time. Yeah, well, there are some things that Stuart's done over the years that I think are just brilliant, and he's definitely influenced my, my approach to stand-up. Sometimes, subconsciously, I realise, after I've been doing a bit for a while, that uh, there's been an element of something he's done before and there are other bits that I find tiresome I find that thing where he just repeats something and spends too long on it and it stops being funny and then supposedly starts being funny again it doesn't start being funny again for me anymore maybe the first time he did that and I think he's disingenuous in the way that he analyzes and dismembers supposed you know uh, right wing ways of thinking or, or whatever that, that there's a kind of there's, there's a tendency to straw man but as I say, that's set against a huge back catalogue of some. And he's so much more great. successful than Richard Herring. Yeah, is Richard Herring just too nice? Well, Herring um, is still pretty successful, but I think Herring recognised early on that he's not really a stand-up. He's he's written a number of plays, but his big thing is you know podcasting and. Um, creating yeah conversations of one kind or another and um but he is he's a multimedia uh, you know engine uh, richard and he's perhaps he is nicer um or less cynical possibly but he is tremendously ex uh, successful by any normal standards whether or not he has a you know he can't quite get the stone out of his shoe that 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 relationship put there I don't know but I, I would want to reassure him he's done tremendously well and he was he was also in the vanguard Richard Herring he was he was a an early adopter of the opportunities presented by the internet and um yeah that's right that's right he, he had right that website there. early on about yeah. about list, finding every registration place in Great Britain in order <laughs> you know about that <laughs> I don't yeah, remember that one, he went through a sort of midlife crisis and people some people deal with it by I don't know having an affair some people deal with it by buying a sports car, he dealt with it by taking up a hobby, which was to find the, you know, the registration plate system, you know, A-Rage, whatever, yes. um, every, every, every single one in order, right. from start to finish. He would go, go around car parks, you know, just try to, it had to be in order. And it took him years and years, and eventually he, he achieved his goal. Well, I did not know that. Uh, this was yeah. on his early adopter, on, yeah. on, on his... Uh, on his on his on his on his website. He used to do a thing called warming up, which was a sort of um, almost automatic writing, I think. But, but there was a um, the morning pages, which is in a, a book called The Artist's Way, which is about just freeing up your silencing your inner critic, essentially stopping yourself from um, editing yourself into inaction. And it was just a, a, the first online blog I ever saw from a, from a, a stand-up. It was every morning he would have written something, and sometimes it was rubbish, and sometimes there'd be something in it that you would think about for the next couple of days. And I remember thinking that was quite a... I mean, it's almost like it going right back to basics with in, in, in terms of um, stand-up as unedited, unfiltered thoughts. And, um, and it takes a certain amount of nerve to do that. I think he's been quite exposing over the years, obviously quite recently with his um, testicular cancer as well. So who has that? Richard. I didn't know that. Yeah, he had a, he had a bollock off. What is this thing ago. with comedy writers and bollocks off? Yeah, I know. That's, I that's, think okay, that's an end Graham, of two. But, Graham but, yeah. was a year earlier, funnily enough. And they, well, he's they, very much a pioneer with comedy. Absolutely, but they connected over that before... Um, no, but he, before pioneered the the he pioneered the comedy he and did. the bollock off. I think so, yeah. Have you got to have a bollock off to be a brilliant comedian? Well, I'm hoping not. No, no. <laughs> but Although, to be fair, they are of very little consequence one way or the other now, I suppose. At, 50, at 58, yeah. I mean, they'd probably, you know, I could probably, I wouldn't want to, but I no. could probably cope And for Farage, Farage. Yeah. Has uh, he? He had a Volokhov. Did he really? Yeah. I did not know that. Something about being charismatic and funny and yes. it causes cancer of the testicles. This is a horrific idea. <laughs> So you've got these unsuccessful comedians out there. I mean, there the with thing with the bollocks. bollocks is they have they have a particular purpose, obviously, but they are also part of the silhouette of manhood, aren't they? To some extent, if perhaps the less you know, the Greek ideal or whatever. The prostate is the big problem, though, for most men, isn't it? Um, medically, in the final third of life, the prostate almost invariably starts causing trouble. Mm. And I think the single greatest medical intervention that could be created for men would be a, would be a way of just excising the prostate as soon as it starts causing trouble. 
I've been thinking about that quite a lot. I'm, my father has been, you know, getting up to go to the loo three or four times in the night for decades. You know, that's a miserable business. The prostate provides no meaningful... Um, produces, produces semen. Yeah, which exactly. Once you no longer want to father children, you can still get an erection without a prostate. You can still enjoy sex. You just don't you have to... sperm. Same. Yeah, you just don't have quite that... It's such a waste of thing. They, they need to have a little like a corkscrew that goes in, gets the old prostate and whips it out. That would be... If you want the Nobel Prize from me, that would be the one. For the prostate? The prostatectomy, a simple... Prostatectomy. Yeah, or possibly like th an ultrasound. But, but yeah, it was the lobotomy that got the Nobel Prize. Yeah. <laughs> which was, which, was, which was, 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 was taking a more gung-ho attitude to dealing with prostate cancer. I would like to address something briefly. In many of my videos, I talk about our evolutionary backgrounds and how our social behaviour today is naturally predisposed. But in doing so, I often assume that you have a basic knowledge of our evolutionary history. This includes not only our descent from apes, but also the history of how we differentiated into different races and peoples. Of course, you can watch all my videos and gather the information from the bits and pieces that I've done, as well as reading up on the sources yourself. But to make it easier for you, there is a good book called Who We Are and How We Got Here by Harvard psychologist Professor David Reich. This book is special because it was one of the first to incorporate the new findings of archaeogenetics. This means that DNA is extracted from ancient bone findings and analysed. Based on these data, we know exactly which peoples migrated from where to where and when. The ancestors of us Europeans, for example, the so-called Indo-Europeans or Yamnaya, probably came from the steppe around 3000 BC and conquered Europe. If you want to hear a short summary of the most important info in this extremely interesting book, you can do so at leagent.com. You can listen to this and many other base titles in under 25 minutes. The difference between Leagent and other similar platforms is that only Leagent covers the really relevant books on topics such as our evolutionary origins as Europeans. So try it now. Go to leagent.com now and sign up with my promo code TJH to get 10% off. Are you ready for the future of the West? <laughs>